Wednesday or Thursday, I was listening to the radio in, in the morning, early, and the host of one of the talk radio shows that I, that I listened to had been without power, I guess, like five days. It's like Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. And he had gotten power back the night before. And there were like three other co-hosts. The other, one other had power, two others still didn't have power. And he was talking about how grateful he was um, that he had gotten power back. And he started tearing up on the radio because he was so, just was, was overwhelmed and tired and, and just, you know, was genuinely grateful that he had power back. And he is a former professional wrestler. So he was so moved that he pulled some strings and he got his buddy Hulk Hogan and one of their sponsors, McDonald's, to get like thousands of dollars worth of McDonald's food. And they were gonna go and take it to the staging area where all the linemen were, who were working on the power, and go do, get some other radio personalities and go do a live on the air thank you to all these linemen. So he says this early in the morning. And within like 30 seconds, they start getting text messages and people are calling in and they're furious. They're livid. Well, I don't have power. Well, they're, they're working so slow, and they're, they're intentionally slowing down because they're paid by the hour, and they're trying to earn more money, and they don't deserve to be thanked because they get paid, and they're working, they're lazy, and they're intentionally slow, and they're not making it to my neighborhood. They, and they don't deserve thanks because they're being paid. And so it became, then it, then it went through this cycle, and it became comparative, and so some people were like, well, you know, really the people who deserve thanks are the truck drivers, because they're the ones that are bringing gas, and the linemen couldn't even do their jobs if they didn't have the material that the truck drivers are bringing, the truck drivers are risking life and limb and driving through life. We should thank the truck drivers, right? The linemen couldn't even do their jobs without them. And well, we should thank the meteorologists, because they're out in the storm reporting so we know where the storm is going, and then it went, we should thank the first responders. We should thank the National Guard. They're pulling people out of flooded houses. And then it went back to this sort of thing uh, that became about transactional gratitude. Like, like gratitude is this currency that has to be earned. It's almost like the implication was if you're being paid, you've already been paid real currency. You don't, get, you don't also get paid gratitude currency. Like it's one or the other. You can, if you're getting paid, you don't also get thanked. And this went on for like 20 minutes, and the whole bit, by the end, the host was so dejected that the end of the bit was it just kind of like fizzled, and then went to break. And it was like this disgusting display. This started out from a genuine place of gratitude, and it became a source of, of fury and anger and comparative merit and transactional thanksgiving. But it got me wondering how situations like this, and I know not for everybody, but I think for a lot of people based on a cursory glance at social media, how do situations like this when we're not in air conditioned churches and when we don't have full bellies and we haven't been able to take a hot shower every day, we're not comfortably reflecting on our beliefs and our ethics and our morals and our practices and our inner lives, things like gratitude, hope, love, Especially in situations where we become uncomfortable, as David pointed out, when we're reminded that despite the illusion, we actually have no power. When things get inconvenient, when we lose our luxuries, how do we live in those moments? And what do we learn about ourselves in those moments? Uh, and, and Pete Rollins makes the, the distinction, not who do we believe we are, but who are we really, right? Not what are the things we carry around in the different compartments in our brains about who we are, but in our material reality, who do we find out we are when things get hard? And one of the reasons I love and appreciate the, the passage that was read tonight from 1 Thessalonians is the fact that it makes this important distinction between that, that sort of plastic smile in a utopian world, nice and pleasant, versus that really hard-fought, practiced way of choosing gratitude, um, especially when things are really tough. And so the, the passage is, give thanks in all circumstances, and if you're like me, you sort of roll your eyes, yeah, right, um, especially when we're talking about gratitude in connection with loss of power, like not just loss of power, but loss of power, where we're no longer in control, where our expectations have been let down, where things have gone really badly, or where we're just flat out uncomfortable, we're not sleeping, and it's really hot, and we don't have control of when that's going to change, but make sure we hear what's being said and what's not, give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. Um, and so like you all said, you said without saying, 
I didn't hear anyone say, you know what I was really genuinely thankful for? I was thankful for Hurricane Irma and the devastation of property and the loss of life, um, the fact that no one is now living on the island of Barbuda. No one is thankful for the hurricane. Loss of power, hot as hell, no AC, sweaty, grumpy, cold shower, leaf breaking, tree hauling, fire ants, mosquito frustration, hellscape. We understand. Nobody's thankful for that. And yet, and so many of you said this, really simple things. Like, hey, we're going to have a dinner in a room with air conditioning, and it's going to have, we'll have pasta. And so many of you that showed up were overwhelmingly grateful. And the people who offered showers. And hey, come to the house and charge your phone. And the people that, that took them up on it, like, falling over themselves, like, oh my God, charge a phone? And like, on any other day, you'd be like, screw you. Well, I'll go charge my phone wherever I want. I'll turn my car on and charge my phone. <laughs> but for some reason, this, like, reduction to having nothing, all of a sudden, this, this basic kindness became overwhelmingly gratitude-producing. We can cultivate gratitude as a way of being even in these sort of thankless situations and circumstances, natural disasters, when things go sideways, not as we planned, not as we anticipated. And, and I think here's the key. Um, learning to be grateful, and, and again, this is the reason we call this practice in our tradition, is because you don't just like think about it and then you know how to do it. You spend your whole life doing this. You have to practice it. But you can learn to be grateful in tough situations and the really simple sermon is this. If you can learn to be grateful, if you can even just try to practice being grateful when it's difficult, it doesn't make it worse. It always makes it better. Right? That's about as easy as we can boil down the sermon. Um, I don't know exactly how that works, or how it, and I know it doesn't always pan out. Sometimes you try to be grateful, and trying to be grateful makes you even more pissed off. I understand that. But learning to be grateful, even when it's difficult, it makes it better. It doesn't make it worse. So... Um, my friend Katie, uh, who runs a congregation at Ormond, she's spoken with us before, Katie Steinberg. Uh, I'm part of a project that's, that's doing stuff, and, and Katie had applied for it, and we had this interview thing that had to be rescheduled. And so we were doing the interviews on Tuesday night, and uh, you know she had just gotten back in town. She had evacuated for the hurricane. Um, it was the 10th anniversary of the death of her mother. They'd gotten back in late, they'd struggled with the gas, they'd struggled with the highways, the interviews were at 7, and she texted that afternoon, like 4.30 or 5, and she's like, is this the only night I can do the interview for this thing? I really want to do it, but here's my situation. If there's any way for me to do it time, I don't think I'll be my best tonight. And I sort of reassured her and said, hey, we're calling this an interview, but this is really like, you definitely got it. Just come and be vulnerable. Come and just tell us your story, be real. Uh, and so she came out. And at the end of the night, it's like 9.30 or 10, and all the candidates are leaving, and she came up and thanked me. Thank you for pushing me to come and do this. This is now like what, four or five days after this devastating hurricane. They still didn't have power. They'd been on the road for like 12 hours one way, 12 hours back, struggling with gas. It's the anniversary of her mother's death. It's 10 o'clock at night. She's got to drive back to Ormond from Winter Park, which is an hour. And the thing she wants to say to me before she leaves is thank you. Thank you. Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Again, I'm not the kind of preacher that can tell you how to do that. I just think it's good advice. Um, we, should, we should try to figure that out. We should practice this. This is a good thing to do. This is a good thing to try and be. Because um, giving, and, and I think the, the thing that I heard on the radio really kind of, what it triggered was the, this idea that giving thanks for is always transactional, right? If I'm giving thanks for something, there's always that sen sense that it's earned. It's a thanks that somehow feels like it needs to be purchased. But giving thanks in is about our need and our desire and our satisfaction that finds completion in gratitude itself. If we can learn to be thankful even in difficult circumstances, that's not about repaying someone. With gratitude, that's about, I have to express this because I'm grateful. And so the host of the show was giving thanks in these rough circumstances, and people were getting frustrated because they didn't see the economics of merit in the transactional four. They disagreed. So he was overwhelmed with gratitude, and it felt like he needed to express it, and it was met with what amounted to a financial controller that said, 
That's unearned income, and you shouldn't spend it. They don't deserve it. Which sort of raises the question, if gratitude is about deserving, is it really gratitude? Right? It doesn't feel like. It feels like a, a cheap imposter. It's not real gratitude. Because gratitude is, is tied to grace. We've talked about this a number of times over the last couple of years. This idea that a rose blooms without why. It arises in unlikely, often very painful and difficult soil. And somehow that's the invitation. Again, I don't know how to tell you to do this, but we might have an opportunity to practice again in the next week or two. And we see this actually in, in the Eucharist, which is why we had that passage from Luke read. But first of all, because this is connected, how many of you, uh, after hurricane cleanup, felt like you can particularly resonate with the feeling like you've got a, a, bo- a broken body? Anyone? Lower back? Anyone try to show off and lift tree limbs larger than you should have? <laughs> Yeah. No, it's only me. I agree. Um, how many of you shed blood? Scratches, scrapes, chainsaws, Peter Begala, chainsaws. Uh, that's all right. It was just his hand. Uh, so, oh, that passage isn't in there anymore. Um, so, the passage says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. He said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. I tell you, I won't eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. And then the next paragraph says, he took the bread and he gave thanks. It's interesting. So there's this pattern, I think, of of thanks and gratitude followed by sharing or dividing. Um, Dividing what we have among one another. And I saw this, and at first I saw it on social media, and then I saw it when I actually was hanging out with some of you guys. And the progression went like this. Yay, we have power. Way too many exclamation points, right? (laughs) Elated, we have power. Does anyone need whatever? Shower, charge, hot meal, coffee. So there's this gratitude followed by divided amongst yourselves. We finally got something. It would feel incomplete if I didn't turn around and say, have some, right? I know that what I've been going through has sucked. (laughs) Yay! Thank God. Please, have some. Because I'm not going to be, honestly, like, there's this weird thing. Like, I'm not going to be happy I have power back unless I get the opportunity to share it. It's that weird kind of connection. And just in case we're unclear, um, Jesus' little object lesson dinner theater thing to illustrate his death, a few chapters earlier in Luke, Jesus pulls the same 12 guys aside, and he says, we're going to go to Jerusalem, where I'll be delivered over to the authorities, I'll be mocked, I'll be insulted, I'll be spit, I'll be flogged on, and they're going to kill me. So he knows. He's going to go up against the empire, he's going to go up against the religious establishment, he already knows he's going to be killed. So in this little body and blood thing that he's doing, they understand what's going on. They get it. And yet, right in the middle of Jesus enacting the fact that he will be executed, twice, it says he gives thanks. He's with his best friends at his last meal, illustrating that he's going to be executed, and he's grateful. He gives thanks. Is he excited that he's going to die? Probably not. No, he's not soaked. No, because we don't give thanks for the hurricane. But somehow he's grateful even in the circumstance. Somehow mysteriously, yes, he's been able to surrender the outcome, even to the point of his own life where he can know he's going to his death, and he gives thanks. And maybe that's the simple invitation to live with and from this question. What does it look like for us to become people who practice gratitude in the storm and in the aftermath of the storm and when we don't want to? And I'll be the first to admit, I accumulated some resentments (laughs) during this past week. There were conversations I should have had that I didn't have, and I felt like, Better not to have them. I'll just hang on to that. That'll be mine. I'll just be pissed off. Even when we don't want to, even when we're so uncomfortable that we can't imagine we have enough sleep and it's a thousand degrees, we can't remember the last time we had a shower, and we don't know what's going on on Facebook. <laughs> even when we don't want to, when things go bad and we lose these luxuries to which we're accustomed, how do we give thanks? and then share that gratitude and then give it away as if we don't need others to earn it. 
right? How do we practice that kind of gratitude as if it's for us, as if it's not for them? It doesn't matter what they've done because we're not waiting for them to do something so we can be thankful, as if it's for us, that we need to be thankful. We won't be satisfied unless we give it. So as we do each week, we remember this Jesus who gives thanks in the midst of doom and loss and insecurity and brokenness and discomfort and another damn hurricane coming. Every time we set this table, we somehow remember a gratitude that lives in the midst of body broken and bloodshed. It's that paradoxical table that we set tonight. As always, it's set for us, but it's open to all people. And no one will ever be turned away. When you're ready, feel free to come grab a piece of bread. Even with pre-cut, it's still, this is Dan and Susan Vaughn, by the way, a robust loaf of bread. Before you make fun of me for the tear, wait till you get up here, try it yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna be watching. Come grab a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. I get to let that.